Um, thank you for um, for inviting me uh, here. This is uh, my first time in, in Japan, so it was a very good experience. Um, so I'm uh, George Paliuras. I work at uh, the largest research center in, in Greece for, national, for um, uh, science in Greece. And um, si since uh, 2012, we have been running uh, the BioASK uh, competition. And um, today I'm happy to present you uh, where we are at the moment and where we, we think we're going to be heading. Uh, what is BioASK? For those who haven't um, heard about it, <clears throat> excuse me. So BioASK uh, combines two different goals, which are complementary in a way. The first is uh, what Dina mentioned er uh, first earlier, which is to uh, index uh, documents in Medline. This is something that NLM is doing um, by manual curation. And uh, we wanted to, to test how well this can be done automatically. So we set up a challenge and people participate to try to do that. The second task has to, is, is much more involved and much more NLP oriented. So in some ways, BIOAS combines information retrieval and NLP. And I think one of the questions that was asked earlier is going to become more apparent here because there are some things that do not require NLP and others are very heavy NLP oriented. So in the second task, uh, we have a number of subtasks. Okay. Um, so there are a number of subtasks and um, some of them are information retrieval oriented and others are um, NLP oriented. And one of the main goals, one of the main things that BioASK wants to, um, to contribute to the community is uh, benchmark data sets. Because when we started, we realized that, especially for question answering, there was not, um, for biomedi biomedical question answering, there was not a, a benchmark that people could, uh, could use to, uh, to build their systems. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, we have been running this task for six years. Six years now, we've started the seventh one a couple of weeks ago. Um, people participate in, can participate in subtasks. They don't have to participate in everything. Uh, there are some pr small prizes uh, for all um, tasks. And uh, uh, one of the main things is to uh, create data, benchmark data that will be open source. And in order to do that, we started with uh, some uh, funding from a European project. And this allowed us to build several tools that uh, most of them are used uh, in the construction and running of the, of the challenge. Um, in, at the core of, of BioASK is the uh, benchmark data sets that we're building. And for the first task, this, this um, is an, a very large num very large proportion of the Medline abstracts, 13.5% <clears throat> um, uh, million articles at this point. And for the test, for the second task, there are um, after this after the end of the third of the seventh bio ask, there's going to be 3,000 questions, uh, biomedical questions that our experts have constructed together with the um, material that is needed to answer those questions. And uh, this, uh, question, this material for task B is generated using some tools that uh, we have developed for annotation and assessment. And um, the experts are required to set up questions, interesting questions, and then uh, provide the answer as well as the material that can be used to answer those questions. As I mentioned, um, I mentioned earlier that most of the infrastructure that we have developed is used in the challenge. One of the things that we are not actively using but is there is a social network that we have developed for um, promoting further the uh, annotation effort. Uh, and we're trying to find ways to do that, uh, to, to put it in action in the next BIOS. 
A few words about how annotation and assessment is done in task B. Uh, the experts have this, uh, this tool that you can see in the, in the slide. They uh, set up a question, uh, and here the question is of type summary. And um, they then run queries in PubMed using the search, the search tab over there to get uh, material, to get documents that are related to, the, uh, to their question. And out of those documents, they extract uh, snippets that are useful for answering the question. And uh, here you can see uh, some snippets down there. This is the answer, the natural language answer that the expert has constructed for this particular question. And you can also see here that in addition to the documents and snippets, there are there is information coming from other sources than, uh, than articles. And these other sources have to do with uh, ontologies and databases that may be related to, uh, to this uh, question. Uh, and there are, they take the form of concepts related to the question and uh, triples to a lesser extent. Uh, depending on the type of the question, the, the user, the expert can also provide exact answers to the question. And here you see an example of a list question where the user provides a list, the list, the desired list of things that the, the system needs to answer and synonyms to those, uh, to those items. And this is uh, in combination with the natural language answer, which is always there. So the systems are asked to provide all this information or some of it if they participate in one part of the task. And um, then the, um, the answers of the systems are collected and the experts are now required to assess the systems using the assessment tool, which looks very similar to the annotation tool. So the look and feel of the two tools is, are, is similar. And here the uh, experts on the left they see uh, the ideal answer together with the answers of the systems. So here's the ideal answer that they have provided, and here are the answers of the system. And the answers can be uh, assessed according to a number of um, criteria. Um, and, but very importantly, the experts are also allowed to modify at this point their answer, dep depending based on the answers that they have seen not only the, the ideal answer that they have provided, but also other material that they have provided for, the, uh, for answering the, the questions, like for the, the related documents. So they can accept some documents that the systems have found and add them to the golden uh, material. This is very important because this material is going to be used as training data for the next year. So uh, we now, with, through this assessment tool, we have the uh, possibility of improving the data that we provide for the training data set for next year. Um, the, the experts, and this is a very central um, idea in BioASK, they are asked to provide questions that, are, that they find interesting. So we don't restrict very much on uh, what type of questions what sort of questions they, the experts can provide. But we do give guidelines so that we avoid some, um, some things that will be very difficult to assess, like controversial, controversial questions or things that change over time. These are things that we want to avoid. And as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> for each of the questions, the experts are now asked to provide a sufficient number of articles snippets that could be used to answer the question, and exact and ideal answers. And the type of questions that we have are four, yes or no questions, uh, entity, uh, entity questions, uh, list questions, and the ones that do, do not have any, any exact answers. So they are, we call them summary questions. 
This is a similar graph to the one that you have seen in the previous presentation uh, regarding participation. Uh, we have, I have omitted the expression of interest uh, bars here for reasons that, you have, that have become apparent in the pre previous presentation. Um, here on the left you see the, uh, the systems that participated because its, par its uh, team can participate with up to five systems. And on the right you see the um, participating teams, uh, the different teams. So um, there are some ups and downs through the years, but there is a stable, again, um, number of participants. Um, but this, num this number does not reflect a, a one um, particular set of teams. This, this is a graph which shows the teams that have participated in the challenge throughout the years. And there is a, uh, a great variety of people and teams coming from different places. Uh, we're proud, proud that there is at least one representative from each continent, although I have to admit that some continents are not very, high, very well represented uh, in the challenge. Um, most people come from uh, the US or North America and uh, Europe and Asia. Um, but there are several people who, who participate. Uh, and now I'm going to get a bit deeper into um, the tasks and how they run to give you some um, idea of, about what's happening. Um, regarding the first task, this is running for uh, 15 weeks each year. So every week we get a new test set. and. Uh, the, the weeks are organized into three batches. Uh, this uh, continuous uh, feed with test sets is very important, we believe, because it gives uh, some direct feedback to the people who participate so that they can improve their system even within a year. So even people who participate for a single year, they have the chance to improve their, their methods throughout the uh, 15 weeks. Uh, another very important aspect here, and this is something that we're very thankful to NLM, is that uh, we don't have to do any manual annotation because this annotation is already done by NLM. Um, and I, have, I think this is a, a key issue in this uh, first task. Another important aspect is that the, uh, the participating teams have to respond within a certain time limit. So they have to respond within 20, 21 hours. And this, for, a, for an international challenge, that, uh, this is not uh, very straightforward because time, time differences play a role. So people have told me that they have to stay up all night in some cases so that they can participate. And if you do that 15, for 15 weeks, it's, it can get quite challenging. Um, these are, this is a, uh, just to give you an idea about the, the, uh, how the data evolve over time. Uh, for task A, uh, it just tells you more or less that the, there's a lot of data. Um, it also tells you how many labels there are um, per article, which is on average 12 point something. Um, per year, we have roughly 150,000 articles as test sets. So every week we get about 6,000 6, articles. These are the articles that have to be processed within 21 hours, about 6,000. And when they are given to the participants, they have not yet been annotated by NLM. So no one knows what the, the real uh, annotations will be but then they are annotated uh, in the next few weeks and we get the results. Regarding evaluation, we're using uh, both what we call flat measures like F measure, uh, micro and macro F measure, but we have also introduced a number of hierarchical measures, so me measures that can tell you how good, how, how good the system is, not, not only by finding the exact mesh term, but also by finding closed terms in the hierarchy. 
And these are all described in this paper that we have written a few years ago. Now, regarding the, the methods that, that are used, uh, the common trend that we see in almost all of those tasks is that there's more deep neural networks being used and being successful in the recent years. Uh, but there are, the fact that the data is so big and uh, also the fact that the problem is what I, I usually call this, this kind of problems big small data problems because you have a lot of data but you also have a very large number of classes so for each class you end up with not necessarily a lot of data so you have big data but also small data for, for each class and this is a, this is a challenge for, uh, for what methods can be used and uh, also for uh, how they're used. This is a graph that I find part particularly interesting and I usually spend a couple of minutes on. Um, this is, so there are three, three lines here. You, I mainly want to focus on the top two ones. Uh, the red one is the one that has to do with the best performing system in the challenge. The green one has to do with uh, the medical text indexer that NLM is using to support the manual annotation. So this is a system that recommends uh, annotations to the uh, manual curators. And you see that there is an, a, an upward trend for both of them. And um, when we thought that we would get to a, a, a plateau, or when we think we're getting to a plateau, there's always something that makes it go, go, go higher. And, but this is not only for the red line, but also for the green line. And there are many reasons for that, many different reasons for that. Um, some of them are, have to do with the improvement of the methods. We get new methods. For instance, this is, at this point here, we have a new team that started winning the competition. Um, but also, I think they also have to do with the interaction between uh, automated annotation and manual annotation. So I think that as automated annotation is improving, we, the, and the MTI system is improving, the, the, the annotators the, who are doing the manual curation they're going to be trusting the automated system more. And this has both positive and negative issues involved. So we're going to be tracking that further in BioSuccess. Uh, closing with uh, task A, um, some of the lessons that we have learned so far. We wanted this to be a real, pro to, to base that on a real process, and this has uh, pros and cons. Um, it affects the process itself, as I mentioned earlier, and there are also unforeseen factors, like the problems with the contracts that NLM may have with the indexes. This can affect the running of the competition. But, you know, we have to live with that. I mean, things happen in the real world. Um, also, the fact that this is a live um, challenge, the, the test data is, is continuously uh, coming in and the uh, annotations change over time, this makes it less uniform throughout the years. As a simple example, the MES terms change every year. So when you get the training data, it is not necessarily completely annotated with the terms that you're going to be finding this year. Um, so there is some, there are some changes. And here perhaps something that I have not put in the, in the presentation but is worth mentioning is that in the platform that we have constructed for the challenge, there is something that we call the Oracle. So, and the Oracle allows you to uh, submit uh, your results 
on all their test data and see how you rank compared to the systems that participated in the past. Of course, this is not leading to any prizes, but it gives you an idea about how good your system might be. Now moving to the most, the more complex task, which is the question answering task. Um, this has two, two parts. I call them the information retrieval part and the uh, more uh, NLP summarization kind of, of part. And we call this phase A and phase B. So in the first phase, the, the systems get uh, the questions and they get, one, uh, they get 100 questions every uh, two weeks. And they have 24 hours to provide the relevant articles, snippets, as well as concepts and triples. So as I mentioned earlier, these are things that do not necessarily come from text. But articles, uh, snippets do come from text. Then once, once the 24 hours have uh, been completed, we provide uh, the golden articles and snippets, the ones that the experts have provided, and we give another 24 hours for the systems to provide exact answers and, and uh, summaries. The evaluation is both automated, for, especially for the information retrieval parts, but also manual. And we do that for five batches, so um, every two weeks we have two days of, uh, of challenges. And of, of course, we make sure that those two days, two days do not coincide with the, the day of the task A challenge, because people need to, some people participate in both, in both tasks. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have um, 2,700 something questions so far. They have been created by 13 experts that were trained to, to do that. Uh, you can also he he see here the distribution between different types of questions, which is mm, fairly balanced. And we have, um, on average, 11 documents, uh, 5 concepts, and 14 snippets per question, related to each question. Um, I have deliberately not mentioned triples here, although we, have, we support that. That's because uh, it, was very, it has turned out to be very hard for the experts to provide the relevant triples. And when they did that, the participation was not uh, very good. And this is something that uh, is worth discussing with the uh, linked annotation uh, people, how we can improve. And it's something also that we're also trying to improve in a project that I, I will mention earlier. And uh, I mentioned already that we have 500 questions each year separated into five batches. Here are the um, evaluation measures that we use for different parts of this task. Uh, mean average precision is used for uh, the retrieval tasks. And then depending on the question type, we're using different um, measures for uh, for the exact answers. And for the uh, summary answers, the what we call the ideal answers, we have tried a number of automated methods, but the manual scores do not correlate very well with the automated ones. Uh, that's because it's not really a summarization task. These, are, these methods have been, used, have been developed mainly for summarization tasks, and this is not really a, a summarization task. Uh, regarding the, the approaches that people adopt uh, uh, for different steps of the process, so for, people who, for those who have worked on question answering, they, they know that there's, there are many different steps involved, analyzing the, quest, the questions, expanding it, retrieving documents, uh, composing the answer, and so on. There have been a large variety of tools, existing tools and methods that have been uh, in deployed, uh, employed for the system. Uh, increasingly, here, we also see neural networks taking over, uh, deep neural networks. Now, system performance, as you can imagine, is not as high as uh, 
the performance that I showed for task A. Uh, here you see for uh, retrieval for articles, snippets, and uh, concepts. Uh, and there have been, there are some changes that I don't want, I don't want to emphasize them too much. They usually have to do with changes that changes that happen to the challenge itself. So it's, it doesn't have to do with the the systems. Uh, regarding the idea lances. Uh, the, the main conclusion here is that if you give us if you give the systems good enough documents and snippets they can provide very decent answers or at least the experts are satisfied with the answers that they see in all different criteria that we have readability recall repetition and precision um, but I have to stress that we do give them as input uh, documents and snippets that are manually selected. So the lessons that we have been learning from this task uh, are more than for task A, I guess, because it's a much harder task. Um, Vocabularies and database, databases change over time, and this um, can affect the challenge that has been running for so long. Uh, we have to adapt to that. It is important to um, listen to the experts and the participants and to monitor things that are happening and adapt the, the challenge itself. Uh, one of the things that people mentioned for, uh, noticed, for instance, is that uh, when we're getting a very, very good results in yes and yes or no questions, uh, just to show the graph again, um, you see at the top here, the yes or no questions are answered fairly robustly, but in the first challenges they, they, they were answered better than in the last ones. The reason for that was that the experts were providing more yes questions than no questions many more yes questions than no questions. When we, asked, when we started asking the experts to provide a more balanced um, set, the problem became a bit harder. Uh, so we need, that's, why, that's why I mentioned here that it is important to um, monitor what, uh, what is happening and to, to listen to what the people have to, have to say. Uh, Triples, as I mentioned earlier, end concepts to some extent have been a problem. Um, at the beginning, when we started, we asked the experts to provide exhaustive, uh, li an exhaustive list of documents that are relevant to their question, an exhaustive set of snippets out of those documents, and as many concepts and triples as they thought are um, important for answering the question. This turned out not to be very uh, not to be very productive so we switched to a different uh, setup where we ask the experts to provide as many documents and snippets as are needed to answer the question and regarding concepts and triples they don't provide anything to start with but they accept or reject the, some of the answers that the systems provide. Now, regarding triples in particular, we have the, the, the um, question of when is a triple related to an, to an answer? How is it related to an answer? Is it part of the answer? Is it um, the answer itself? It's very difficult to assess whether a triple is, is, a, is a good answer or not, or is, a, is something that should be used for the answer or not. Um, to some extent, we get that also for concepts. Are the concepts related to the question or to the answer? This is not necessarily the same thing. 
Another thing, another issue that we have been um, thinking about is whether full text should be used. And surely, full text contains much more information. Um, should we use it or not? I think it is important. So these are some some. I'm not saying that I have the answers to all of those all of those uh, questions, but. These are important things. Another task that we have um, tried to introduce uh, in BIOSC 5 is to identify funding information uh, from PubMed Central uh, full text articles. This is something of uh, practical importance. Um, we didn't continue that because it was very difficult to make to make a meaningful um, share task out of it. The way in which we get this information made it, we had, it was not very clear to distinguish wh what sort of, uh, of golden data comes from automated systems and which ones are manually curated um, and which are included in the text and which aren't. Um, so we ended up restricting the, system, the task to something that was not particularly challenging for, for the participants. So, um, closing, moving to the, to the last few slides of the, of the presentation, um, looking back and, and from, from some distance at the running of the challenge, uh, I think there are some important aspects that uh, we try to we try now to preserve we try to preserve preserve stability so we try to not not shift the goal posts too much I think this is important for people who participate um, we are aware that things will change over time and if we were if we, if we are to to have bios running in the future, we want to um, to be adaptive. Also, we do want innovation, so we do we do want to in, introduce new things to the challenge, but this has to be done in a controlled manner. This, so there's a balance between stability and innovation that we need to preserve. Uh, real world ta real world tasks turn out turn out turn out to be hard, but at the same time the um, reward that you're getting get, that you're getting when you are having real life impact is very very high so i think it's worth going for real world tasks sustainability of the of the challenge is another important issue how do you get the challenge to run for for a long time automation to the extent that is possible is very important trust by the community uh, these are now interlinked, so one of the one affects the other. Uh, impact, you know, ma maintaining impact is important. Another important issue is um, for challenges like BioAsk is that they are cross-disciplinary. So we tend to um, to talk to people in our in our own community in NLP in I, in IR, but. Here we're talking about systems that are going to be used, used by biomedical people. Shouldn't we be presenting the, the results to them? Shouldn't we ask them to what, what is interesting and, and what not? So uh, for the future, there are many things that we want to, um, to improve upon and uh, try out but as I, as I mentioned earlier we're going to be doing that stepwise so this has to do with the fact that we don't want to change the the challenge too much every year but it also has to do with resources and planning and for task a you see we want to um to see how much automated alignment we can have uh, of the different mesh versions um, we want to try different types of annotations. This is important for the project that we're currently running. Um, and also another thing that 
was proposed by one of the participants is, would it not be interesting to identify data sets in the literature, data sets that are used? And some of it is already done in, in, uh, by the uh, curators in NLM. Um, and some others, but some data sets are not in the standard repositories. In task B, uh, there is a, a big discussion that is going on about how we can combine structured with unstructured data. I mentioned the problems with triples. Um, we want to do more work than uh, like the work that was presented earlier about looking at the BIOS datasets and the BIOS, BIOS challenge overall and writing a few papers. This is another uh, issue with resources having, having a, enough time to write the papers. And another, another aspect that I find quite interesting is how we can get more community-driven curation how we can get people to, to provide uh, data, especially for task B. Something else that we are starting to, to build upon is to create a, a, an open repository for, for systems that have participated in the challenge. And there are some that are already open and we, we're trying to encourage more of the participants to make their systems open source. Uh, we think this is important also for promoting their own work through BioASK. And uh, in collaboration with the people in uh, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, uh, we are setting up for later this year uh, Task A for Spanish. So um, we're very grateful that Martin and his team has, have proposed that, and we hope that this is something that will be uh, very interesting for the participants. This is going to be running very much a lot, uh, in, in similar ways like we did with NLM uh, so far. Um, I would like to, I hope that I have included everyone uh, who has helped us so far. There are many teams and people who have helped us with BioASK, uh, starting with the people at NLM who have been extremely helpful and responsive. Um, People from Carnegie Mellon have provided a very nice open source baseline for question answering. Uh, Zintong has, uh, has uh, proposed an, uh, some very interesting collaboration with Power Notation. And uh, the project that I have sort of mentioned throughout the talk, the ESS project is a, project, a European project that we're running at the moment. And as part of it, a small part of it, I have to admit, we have question answering for um, for responding uh, to uh, queries that medical people have over uh, big heterogeneous biomedical data that we are putting together. Uh, another set of people that I have to thank is the, the different organizations that have helped in building the infrastructure that we're using. And there are many different uh, European organizations in, that were involved in the European project to start with. And the sponsors uh, that we have and we had, uh, starting with the European Union, who supported us at the beginning, uh, NLM, who supported us with a grant later on, and Viso, who has supported us um, at some point. But most, very importantly, Atipon is a company who is supporting us throughout the years. And uh, there is a, a company that I'm not sure yet if I can mention the name of, that's why we have the question mark. It's a big, it's one of the very big uh, computer IT companies who is supporting us this year. And hopefully soon we will be able to, to mention the name. <laughs> so thank you for listening and uh, uh, I hope that you will all be participating in BioASK 7. Thank you.